It's a great honor to be standing here today to introduce Dr. David Johnson, who I can call a friend, a mentor, and I love when he comes in and fills the pulpit. We continue to hear great messages. I don't want to mess myself up like I did last time, but uh, the pastor is a great speaker, but I love listening to Dr. Johnson as well. So Dr. Johnson, come on up and bring with us what God has laid on your heart. This is an exciting time. We are moving into Christmas. Amen. Exciting and mission. So Dr. Amen. Johnson, Thanks. please. Good morning. It's good to see you here this morning, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you to Pastor Ed for <clears throat> the invitation to come and share with you today as you kick off your week of prayer for international missions and uh, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Uh, I'm excited to be here today and just celebrate with you at, at this, uh, this time. I want to say thank you to this church for your generous giving to the cooperative program. Last year, this church gave almost $35,000 to the cooperative program. That means that you were part of sending missionaries around the world and planting churches uh, in North America and here in Arizona and educating seminary students, preparing people for ministry and missions all around our country and six different seminaries and then supporting ministries in Arizona like Arizona Baptist Children's Services and Christian Challenge and Gateway Seminary. So thankful for what you all give. In addition, you guys gave generously last year to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, and I noticed that this year you have set a goal for $7,000. That is amazing. And I believe God is going to just bless over and above that as this church gives. You know, the national goal this year is $175 million. We've never given that much before. $175 million. Do you know why $175 million? Because this year marks the 175th anniversary of the International Mission Board. 175 years of sending missionaries all around the world to share the gospel with people who have never heard it. Starting with the very first Southern Baptist missionary that was sent in 1845, Samuel Clopton, who went to China and died three weeks later. And you read the history of our early missionaries and how many of them died when they got to the field or shortly thereafter and how people continued to give their lives for missions. They did not let that deter them. It makes you really appreciate what those early missionaries did. And then came a lady by the name of Lottie Moon. Four foot six. I've had my picture taken next to a, a cutout of Lottie Moon. She's about this tall. But she was a giant in missions continued to write back to the United States asking, where are the men? Why are not more preachers signing up to come and be missionaries? Well, we know why. They were looking at a death sentence. They went to missions. And she challenged Southern Baptists not only to send more missionaries, but to send more funding for missionaries and she said, wouldn't it be wonderful if during the Christmas season, when we celebrate the Savior's birth, if we would give a gift in honor of him to send the message of the gospel around the world. That's why it's called the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. And that young lady gave her life as she died in the service of missions. Before she could be brought back to the United States, she died in a harbor on a ship with all of her earthly possessions in a small trunk next to her in that cabin. It's a pretty amazing story. But that's the reason why we have a Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And this year, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could, as a collective, Southern Baptists across uh, our country and around the world, because our missionaries give to this offering, they give, they give sacrificially, I know that, uh, from experience. $175 million, wouldn't that be amazing? Let's pray for that. Let's pray for that this week. Let's pray that God will not only allow you guys to exceed the, the goal that you've set of 7,000, but to exceed our goal of 175 million uh, across the country. This has been one crazy year. Amen? Amen. Crazy year. COVID-19, churches closing down, not meeting, schools closing down, businesses closing 
And we saw all of the unrest that took place during this year, racial riots like we've not seen since the 1960s. Mitch, I thought we were done with all of that. And then the political campaigns were so ugly, harsh, rhetoric so ugly. It's been a terrible year. I heard a guy speak the other day, and he said uh, he used the term VUCA. He said, we live in a VUCA world. I didn't know what that meant. I had to look it up. It's a military term, Steve. It's a military term. And they use that term when they go into situations that are volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. And he said, we live in a, a VUCA world. And I, I got to thinking about that. And from, from our perspective, where we live and where we see things, the world may appear VUCA. But from God's perspective, it is anything but VUCA. Now, it may be, a, it may be complex. And, and there are times that it may appear ambiguous. But God's plan is moving forward. He wasn't taken by surprise by any of the things that happened this year. He wasn't backstepping, backpedaling, trying to figure out, okay, what am I going to do now? Churches are, are closing. What's going to happen now? We're not able to send missionaries. What's going to happen? God had a plan for all of this. He is not taken by surprise, nor has he suddenly lost control in looking for what he's going to do next. If you don't hear anything I say today, I want you to hear this statement. This is the one idea I'd like for you to go away with today. God's mission moves forward in spite of events in the world around us and is actually advanced through crisis as part of his sovereign plan. Now I'm going to say that again just so I can get it in front of you. This is the big idea. God's mission moves forward in spite of events in the world around us and is actually advanced through crisis as part of his sovereign plan. And you may say, well, that's a great statement, preacher. But where do you find that in the Bible? Well, let me just give you a great example of a statement that reflects what I just said in Philippians chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to Philippians chapter 1, and I want to just reflect a little bit today on a statement made by the Apostle Paul as he is in prison in Rome and he is reflecting on what has happened to him. And he makes a statement that I think gives us pause. And we're going to start here, but I want us to look at some events that take place during the lifetime of the Apostle Paul that, that others might have said appeared to be VUCA. Volatile and uncertain and complex and ambiguous. But from God's perspective, they were anything but that. But I want you to listen to these words in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. This is what he says. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is because I am in Christ. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would give us insight today and that you would help us not only to understand your word, but your plan and how you're carrying out that plan in the world around us in spite of the events that we see taking place and, Lord, you are actually using those events. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul says, I want you to know that everything that's happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Now, that's an incredible statement when you think about what actually happened to the Apostle Paul and where he was when he writes these words. He's actually in prison. And he is incarcerated because of preaching the gospel because he is in Christ. And what he says is, all of this has happened to me. It actually has served to advance the gospel. How is that possible? Well, I want us to look at some events that took place that sometimes as we're reading the scriptures, we just kind of gloss over these things. We, we don't intend to, but we, we read over something and we think, oh, that's interesting. But then we don't realize what God is really doing. So 
to get us started, I want us to go to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. And we're going to kind of work our way through some events that take place in this passage through the book of Acts. And I want you to see some things that happened that actually advanced the gospel that probably looked pretty tragic, pretty volatile, pretty complex uh, in their day. Acts chapter 11, starting in verse 27, I want to read these words. It says, In those days some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and predicted by the Spirit that there would be a severe famine throughout the Roman world. This took place during the reign of Claudius. Each of the disciples, according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brothers and sisters who lived in Judea. This they did, sending it to the elders by means of Barnabas and Saul. Isn't that interesting? So we have this new church that's, that's opened up in Antioch, primarily Gentiles, non-Jewish believers. And they have come to know Christ, they've placed their faith in him, and now they are part of the church. And then you've got this church in Jerusalem, primarily Jewish believers. You may or may not have known this, but there was some racial tension between Jew and Gentile. They didn't get along. And so now you have this worldwide famine. Now we're used to having another word at the end of that sentence, a worldwide pandemic. All right, call it what you will. It was an event that affected the whole world. A famine, a shortage of food, and people were suffering as a result of that. And because there was particular suffering in Judea, in the area of Jerusalem, the believers in Antioch, who were not Jewish, take up an offering and send it down to Jerusalem to help their brothers and sisters in Christ who are Jews. What did that do? It actually advanced the gospel. And it advanced the gospel by showing that Gentile believers cared for their Jewish brothers and sisters, and that caused them to say, wow, this is different. Something is happening here. Something has changed in our relationship between Jew and Gentile. Now something has brought us together. What is that? It is faith in Jesus Christ. It is what Jesus Christ has done in our lives. And that provided opportunity for witness. Even in the whole Judean countryside and in the Jerusalem community, in the community of Jewish believers, look, look what's happened. Gentiles are now helping us in our distress because they believe in Jesus Christ and we've been brought together in Jesus Christ. This famine provided an opportunity for the gospel to be advanced. Now I'm sure to those in that day that were suffering from that, they were thinking anything but God may use this for his purposes to advance the gospel. But God did that very thing. God uses suffering of all kinds and he uses it for his purposes. And his purpose is to bring people to a knowledge of himself. Now, I don't want you to miss this. Now, doc, Dr. Kowalski, he'll, he'll be interested in this. On page three of this little prayer guide, actually day three, on Tuesday, December the 1st, there is a wonderful story about somebody that you know. His name is Dr. Doug Derbyshire. Some of you might remember Dr. Derbyshire. He did his medical school right here in Tucson at the University of Arizona because he's from Arizona. And he went from his experience here as a medical student at the University of Arizona to Thailand with his wife, Cheryl, to be missionaries with the International uh, Mission Board. And they went there as medical missionaries. What they do in Thailand is they go to places that have no gospel witness and they practice medicine there and they share with them, look, what we're doing today is going to help you in your physical body, but we've come with a message that is for your spiritual well-being. And then they share with them the message of Jesus Christ, how they can come to know him and know for eternity they're going to spend uh, their lives with God. Eternal life. Dr. Doug Derbyshire, in my pocket today, I'm carrying a mask. Most of you are. 
This is a mass that we ordered from a ministry that was started by Cheryl Derbyshire called Thai Country Trim. Now I want to say that very carefully because you can go to Etsy.com today and you can order items from Thai Country Trim. Some of the most beautiful Christmas ornaments. Uh, one of the best stories that you'll ever find called The Christmas Elephant written by uh, Dr. Doug Derbyshire about an experience he had as a missionary. Do you know why they started this company? Because there were women in Thailand that needed employment. They were subject to the sex trade, human trafficking. And they started a business so they could employ those women so that they could keep them out of that and in the process be able to share the gospel. And so when Cheryl came to me a few months ago and she said, COVID has just devastated our orders online. Is there any, anything that you might need from us? And she had some examples of masks that they had made. And I said, well, those are nice, but I would really like to have one with our imprint on it, our, our convention imprint. I'm kind of a logo guy. I like that. And so she said, I think we can do that. So I ordered 300 of these masks just so I could give them out. And I like to tell the story of Thai Country Trim because this is a, a business that's a ministry that's a part of sharing the gospel with people in Thailand. And I think that's a wonderful investment. Not only did I get a really great mask, this is the most comfortable mask I own. And I don't just say that. I've got like four or five different kinds of masks. And this one is so comfortable, and it works so well, and I can breathe. It's awesome. So I love this mask, but I love telling people the story of this mask because we're doing something that helps people, just like this offering did to the famine, and it helped advance the gospel, just like Doug and Cheryl Derbyshire have done in Thailand for years with their medical missions work. Would God use something like that to advance the gospel? Absolutely he would even if there was a worldwide famine or pandemic. Now just look a couple of pages over in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, another little event that takes place that sometimes we don't pay a lot of attention to. Acts chapter 18, Paul is... Uh, going to Corinth because he's had a, a less than stellar preaching experience in Athens and he got thrown out, thrown out of town. And so uh, he goes to Corinth in Acts chapter 18 and look what happens. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth where he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus who had recently come from Italy with his wife <coughs> Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul came to them, and since they were of the same occupation, tent makers by trade, he stayed with them and worked. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. Did you notice anything interesting in those verses? He runs into this couple who are believers, and they have come from Rome. The reason they came from Rome is because they were thrown out. And they were thrown out by Claudius, the emperor. And we just read over that and we think, oh, that's interesting. You know why they were thrown out? Well, the Roman historian Suetonius tells us that during the time of Claudius, there was a, a, a great disparity among the Jews that were living in Rome. And the conflict became so great that Claudius said, look, all of you just leave, because one thing the Romans could not tolerate was uh, disruption to the Roman peace, the Pax Romana. You guys just have to leave, all of you. He didn't say who's right or who's wrong. He just said, get out of town. And Suetonius tells us that those riots, this unrest, took place because of a controversy over one by the name of Crestus. Now, most are convinced that Suetonius didn't really understand what the name was, and so he misspelled it in Latin, and it should have been Christus. They had a dispute over Christ. Jews who were believers and Jews who were not believers disputed over who Jesus was, over Jesus being Christ, the Messiah. That's the, that's the Greek word for Messiah. And because of that disagreement and because of the rioting, they were thrown out of town. Would, would God use riots? Would God use unrest? Would he use division and controversy to advance the gospel? Well, here's what happens. 
Aquila and Priscilla go to Corinth. They don't have anywhere else to go. And they start practicing their trade, which is making tents. And because Paul is also a tent maker, they start working with Paul, which then enabled Paul to spend full time telling, telling people about Jesus and teaching the scriptures so that Paul was then freed up as he worked with, with Aquila and Priscilla to be able to advance the gospel. God sent two missionaries to Corinth who got thrown out of town from Rome. Isn't that amazing? A little bit later, they, they actually disciple a young guy by the name of Apollos, who then begins to preach the gospel and, and leads the work in Corinth. God sent missionaries to Corinth as a result of political unrest. Isn't that interesting? Do you know in 1949... Mao Zedong led the communist movement in China. And when that happened, he expelled all Western missionaries, everyone. And the, the Christian world was devastated. What is going to happen to the church in China? And they just thought the whole thing would just implode. Of course, what we discovered 30 years later when we were able to get back into China and see what had happened was that the underground church had exploded in China. There were millions of believers, maybe more so than there would have been had the missionaries been allowed to stay. But the other side of that story is not often told. Where did those missionaries go? What happened to those missionaries? They went all over the world working with Chinese people, working with Asian people. You know, part of my role, what I do as executive director, is I work with uh, church planters, and sometimes those planters have come from other countries. And uh, it's, it's up to us, because I'm the denominational re representative, to sign off on their immigration papers. So we have a Filipino church planter by the name of Raleigh Delgado. Came here from the Philippines, and, and uh, he came by my office one day. I had to sign off on his immigration paper. And so um, while I'm signing that, I always like to ask this question. So Raleigh, tell me your story. How was it that you became a believer? He said, well, it's an interesting story. He says, in 1950, my mother and my grandmother heard some missionaries that had been expelled from China that came to our village and told us about Jesus. And I heard the gospel from my mother and my grandmother because those IMB missionaries had, had shared that with her. And he said, then when I became a teenager, I began traveling with those IMB missionaries around to other villages so that I could translate for them as they shared the gospel. And then God called me to be a pastor. And then God called me here to plant a church among Filipino people. Isn't that interesting? that we have a church planter in Arizona planting a church among Filipinos because the missionaries were expelled from China in 1949. Would God use a communist regime to advance the gospel? Yes, he will. And he did. And we get so upset about these political changes and movements and What's going to happen next? And the world is just coming to an end. And God's mission is moving forward. I'm excited about what God's going to do in the future, how he's going to use all of these events. It's, it's going to be amazing to see what God does. Because God's mission is constantly moving forward. No matter what happens. Well, let's look at one more. This is exciting. Let's, this is fun. Let's go to Acts 21. Acts 21, let's see what happens to the Apostle Paul next as he comes back to Jerusalem from his mission trip, you know, expecting parades and welcomes and fireworks and all of that. Well, there was some fireworks, but not the kind that Paul was expecting. Here's, here's what happens. Acts chapter 21, let's start in verse 26. So the next day, Paul took the man, having purified himself along with them, and entered the temple, announcing the completion of the purification days when the offering will be made for each of them. So Paul is, is going through a ritual for the sake of his Jewish brothers in his, uh, in his race 
so that he might be able to, to complete this and uh, demonstrate to them that he is uh, still serious about uh, practicing his uh, Judaism, but he wants to be able to share the gospel with them as well. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd, and seized him, shouting, Fellow Israelites, help! This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people, our law, and this place. What's more, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with him. And they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. The whole city was stirred up. And the people rushed together. They seized Paul, dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. As they were trying to kill him, word went up to the commander of the regiment that all Jerusalem was in chaos. Taking, all soldiers, taking along soldiers and centurions, he immediately ran down to them. Seeing the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander approached, took him into custody, and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Dangerous man. He asked him who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing and some another. Since he was not able to get reliable information because of the uproar, he ordered him to be taken into the barracks. When Paul got to the steps, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd, for the mass of people were yelling, get rid of him. Riot, unrest, violence, beating, Crowds shouting at one another. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. And somehow, in the midst of all of that, God is using these events to advance the gospel. Because in the next chapter, Paul has the opportunity to stand up and give his testimony. And then, taken under arrest, taken with, with bands of soldiers, they take him to Caesarea, where he is imprisoned for two years. I want you to hear that. Two years. Sometimes we kind of gloss over those times as well. You wonder what Paul was thinking in the two years he's in jail in Caesarea? God, what are you doing? I mean, is this the end? Uh, is, am, am I done? Is, is this my, the end of my mission? Is this, this time in this prison in Caesarea? But during that time, he has the opportunity to share the gospel with Felix, who is the ruler. And then there's a change of political office. Felix is succeeded by a guy named Festus. And at that point, the Jews from Jerusalem come and they say, hey, look, we've got something against this guy, and we'd like for you to, to have him come to Jerusalem so he can stand trial. And Felix says, well, what do you think about that? And Paul says, look, I'm going to appeal to Caesar. And so he makes his appeal to Caesar. Because all along, Paul's goal and what God had planted in his heart was to go to Rome to share the gospel. And now through a political change of office, he gets an all-expense-paid trip escorted all the way to Rome. Isn't that amazing? Now, do you begin to wonder why Paul says, brothers and sisters, I want you to know that all the things that have happened to me have happened, have actually advanced the gospel. Advanced the gospel. You know, when Paul writes that, he's in prison, which actually allowed Paul the opportunity to write the letters that we read today. And you think about how, how much impact those letters have made on the world to advance the gospel. And you think about the ways that Paul was able to not only share the gospel there, but, but to ensure the, the security and the, the, the firm foundation of the gospel through those letters by being in prison for those times. Some people think Paul began writing those letters when he was in Caesarea. It's possible. And you think about what happens when Paul is in prison. He is able to share the gospel with the whole imperial guard, he says. Every soldier that's chained to him is a captive audience to the gospel. And all of that came through violence, political unrest, riots, all, all of this chaos. And we think, how in the world could God use that? You know, a few years ago, we watched really with, with great concern when ISIS took over Syria. 
It was violent. It was oppressive. Missionaries had to leave, and people fled the violence of ISIS. They went to countries all around the Mediterranean, Mesopotamia, Greece, all of those countries. But what was interesting was people that had never had access to the gospel that our missionaries had never been able to share with were now gathered in refugee camps. And they were open to the gospel because our missionaries could go in and begin, begin to share with them in those refugee camps, going in to help meet their needs physically, but to share with them the message of the gospel so they could come to know Jesus Christ. Could God use ISIS for his glory? Could God use ISIS to advance the gospel? He did. He can. And he will. All these events that take place, when we think things are just falling apart, God is using those events to advance the gospel. His mission is unstoppable. Look at what's happened during COVID-19. It's been, a, it's been a, a hard year for churches. It's been a difficult time. But churches made some changes. They made a pivot. And, and they started having online worship. They started making it possible for people to experience worship and hear the message online, on the Internet. And churches now that I talk to, they talk about how many people they have viewing their services or how many people are engaged with them online. We have a church in Arizona that now has a small group in Alaska because the people in Alaska were watching their worship service and they formed a small group up there. I mean, it's extended church's reach beyond anything they ever imagined. As one pastor told me, it took us 60 years to try to get face-to-face uh, -face worship right, and now in two weeks we have to do Internet worship. <laughs> and it was a little rough at first. I was watching. I'm, I'm telling you, there were some that I thought, oh, man, those guys, they're, they're, they need to work on that. But they did. And it's extended the gospel's reach. Look at what churches have done in being able to reach out to people who are in distress and in crisis during, during COVID-19. If you get Portraits Magazine, just read some of those stories. Churches in Casa Grande that got together to distribute food. Churches here that sent food up to the Navajo Reservation. All of that to be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ while they're ministering to the needs of people. It's pretty amazing. And we have churches that have had some pretty remarkable experiences. We have one church in Arizona that has baptized over 200 people since COVID began. 200 people. And that began with them having online baptisms. And people seeing those baptisms and say, th thinking, I'd like to be baptized. And they would come and they would bring their family members. And the family members would say, well, I need to know about this so I can be baptized. And it's one after the other, after the other, after the other. And now they've baptized over 200 people. We had a pastor I talked to recently in a city just outside of Phoenix. And he said that during COVID, they were able to meet because they have a large auditorium. They have a relatively small congregation. They're able to socially distance. And a man started coming, just kind of sitting in the back. He said, my church is closed. Is it okay if I come here? Yeah, it's, it's just fine. And just a few weeks ago, that man came to know Christ. Amen. And he was baptized because his Mormon ward was not meeting Amen. during COVID. He came to the Baptist church because they were open. God uses even events like COVID-19. Now, I don't mean to diminish the tragedy and the difficulty of what's happened to us in this past year. I just come to give you a word of encouragement. And this word of encouragement is that God's mission is unstoppable. It's moving forward in spite of the difficulties that we're experiencing today. And I want to encourage you that that mission is not just here, but it's all around the world. You can't stop the mission of God. Persecution couldn't stop it. Caesar couldn't stop it. Islam, Islam didn't stop it. Communism couldn't stop it. Atheism didn't stop it. The secular media can't stop it. COVID-19 can't stop it. Politics can't stop it. Nothing can stop the mission of God. And when all of this is over, when all of this is over, the question that will be asked is this. 
when COVID-19 happened and all of these things took place, where were you and what were you doing to advance the mission of God? Because I'm convinced when this is over, we're going to hear some amazing stories about how God was working through all of these events. Will we join him? Will we be a part of this unstoppable mission? Praying, giving, going, sharing, telling, being a part of the unstoppable mission of God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you that your mission cannot be stopped. And that, Lord, we can join you in this mission. Lord, help us. Help us not to see all of the problems and and adversity and barriers and challenges, but help us to see what you can do in spite of them for your glory. And Lord, I pray that as you are speaking to us, as you lead us, as as you call us to join you in this mission, that we would be obedient. Lord, maybe this morning we've never come to know you as Lord and Savior. And this morning we've, we've heard about how your mission is moving forward. Lord, maybe today is the time for us to, to place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. To receive the salvation, forgiveness, the eternal life that you offer to us. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here that has not made that decision, that even this morning they would do that. But Lord, I pray that all of us would consider what it is that you want us to do to join you in this mission. That we would pray, that we would give, that we would go in this unstoppable mission of God. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.